You're listening to The Back 40, the podcast for Ontario farmers, covering topics and issues that matter most to Ontario agriculture. Brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm the host of The Back 40, Mike Bryan, agribusiness specialist at Trillium Mutual Insurance. Wasn't that long ago that farmers were worried that the prices of commodities were going to be too low in order for them to make money. It was going to have tight margins. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, prices seem to have turned around to the point where today and at the beginning of this year, we saw some pretty high corn prices and very high both in the wheat and soybean as well. And it's not all due to the conflict that we see in Ukraine We've seen those increases in uh, commodity prices before that conflict started. We're speaking today with Pat Bushby. Pat is from the grain trade industry. He worked for the Saskatchewan Wheat Pool and Viterra, who's also the president of the Grain Elevator and Processing Society and the chair of the Lakehead Terminal Society. He has retired from that today, but uh, still keeps himself busy. He's a director with Trillium Mutual Insurance. We're very pleased to have him with us today. Pat, welcome to the Back 40. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So tell me, how did you get started in the grain trade? Well, Mike, it uh, it was quite interesting. Actually, I uh, my background is in mechanical engineering and started out with a small consulting firm. And we were doing dust control improvements for the grain elevators, primarily in Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay was a known export facility and at one point had the record for Canadian exports uh, out of this area through the St. Lawrence. Just a little history here, Canada used to be a, a major exporter to Russia, and the tide has changed. But anyways, we were doing uh, second generation dust control bag filters for the elevators, and I, I kind of I liked that business. And then there was an opportunity with Saskatchewan Wheat Pool, who operated an engineering office here in Thunder Bay. So it was a logical move and continued on doing, uh, for a very short time in their engineering group, doing work on uh, dust control improvements. But also, there was a whole revolution in terms of mechanization. We put in more modern cleaning facilities and grain conveyance facilities throughout the facilities. And I moved on into a very short time, I guess, in in engineering, moved into maintenance. I was the maintenance and general engineering superintendent with Saskatchewan Weepool. And then moved into operations. I was the general manager of Lakehead in Eastern Canada, and then became a director when Viterra took over Saskatchewan Wheat Pool. I looked after primarily Ontario and Quebec's operations. So you've got a lot of experience in this. Tell me, why have we seen such high commodity prices uh, when it wasn't that long ago that we were really concerned about that? You know, there's a lot of things that have changed in the world. And even before the, uh, the conflict in the Ukraine, we saw a number of drought patterns establish. Certainly, we're very familiar with the one in Western Canada where Canadian production was on a high. We were hitting probably 78 million metric tons of production, and we had carryover probably in the 8 million metric ton range from the previous year to last year when it crashed to about 42 million metric tons. So the reduction of that supply, and it's not only in in Canada, we saw issues in South America as well, problems with the uh, soybeans. It's a net tightening of available stocks in the world that started to generate price increases in a lot of these commodities. And then on top of all of that, then we see the conflict in the Ukraine. As you know, the the Ukraine is the, the breadbasket of Europe, and it's a major, major supplier of world grain, in particular wheat and corn and sunflower. So it's a whole host of these issues. On top of all of that, now what's driving some of these prices is unbelievably high prices for fuel and for fertilizers. So all of these inputs are really, really adding to the cost of production. And uh, consequently, they're, they're just flowing into high prices for all of the commodities. And really, it, it, as we move forward, it, I don't see it easing at any particular point in time. Well, I think we all appreciate the tragedy that is taking place there because of the war. And certainly on an individual and a personal level, the human toll there is, is huge. But from a farming standpoint, just how bad is this going to be this year for food production out of Ukraine? Well, I'm going to start, Mike, with an interesting story. 
farmers are a hardy, hardy breed. And we talk about this all the time in different areas of Canada, the U.S., and all around the world. But I'm telling you, I saw a very interesting picture of a producer in a field in the Ukraine standing by his tractor. The caption was, I don't have diesel. But this producer was standing with a flak jacket on, and he was ready to go and get his fields ready to plant. So that's resilience. That's real. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, well, that's a resilience in the Ukraine for this type of, of movement, but it speaks to this is what farmers do. These are what farmers or producers do. They want to be out there in those fields. It was an interesting sight for sure. Part of my career, I, I was on an assignment in Poland. So Poland borders the Ukraine. I was on the Baltic Sea. We were doing a terminal there. You know, the Ukraine is, the land is very arable and it's the richest black soil probably in the world. And that's why they, you know, it was always known as the breadbasket of Europe. And crop farming is probably 73% of the agricultural output of the Ukraine. Exports in 2021 were in excess of 30 billion U.S. dollars. So ag is big there. And it's 10% of the GDP in the country. They have over 26 million hectares of land in production. And that's on grain and oil seeds. 7 million hectares in corn production. So, you know, you're looking at about 33 million hectares of land that's dedicated to that type of cropping. And they're big in other crops as well. They grow a lot of sugar beets for sugar and potatoes. And there's over 10 million hectares of land that's dedicated to that production. The grain and the oil seed production in the Ukraine in 2019-20 crop year was over 98 million metric tons. If you think about that, I, I saw some interesting stats. That's enough food production or ag production to feed over 450 million people in the world. So think about that. You know, like that's it's huge. And in crop year 19 and 20, the Ukraine in combined exports was number two in the world in terms of uh, you know crop exports. And and 25 to 30 percent of the production in the Ukraine goes to domestic consumption and animal feed, alcohol, mm -hmm. and uh, they're actually doing things, the uh, uh, ethanol production there. So they are they're very, very um, diversified, but huge output. And as I mentioned earlier, some of, the, uh, some of the top commodities for the Ukraine are, it's wheat, it's over 30 million metric tons a year production. Corn is over 36 million metric tons per year. Sunflower seeds, 16 million, and barley over 10. But the top three, the wheat, the corn, and the barley, uh, you know, that was over 80 million metric tons against that 98 million that I spoke of earlier. So huge, absolutely huge. But they also produce soya beans, canola, and rye. It's a big, big producer. I think a lot of our listeners up till the war started weren't aware maybe just how important Ukraine is to feeding the world. But as you said there, they're the second largest exporter of agricultural. That's huge. What are we looking at? Where is that number going to go in the very near future here? We're going to obviously see quite a drop off in that. You know, and, and there's a lot of variability in what people are thinking right now. But in terms of the war, I've read numbers from anywhere from a decrease of 60% in production to 40%. You know, for our listeners' benefit, where most of the crop is grown in the Ukraine is in the eastern section and the southern section. You know, there is crop growing all over, but those are the two primary high production areas. And unfortunately, that's the zone of the conflict. So it's hard to say. It's all going to be dependent if this conflict can get resolved. Uh, I'm a little more doubtful that that's going to happen. The uh, producers want to be out in the field. As I said with that example, they definitely want to be there. A lot of the land that would be farmed is being shelled or has been mined, has been occupied and then mined by Russian forces. So it's hard to say. It really is hard to say. Um, I'm optimistic that it could be on the lower side. I really hope so. Like I said, I think there is a real resilience and effort for producers to get out there and do what they can. But I'm not hopeful there's going to be anywhere close to full production. Yet. And here's another a bit of information for our producers. That whole southern area is critical 
for the exports to happen out of the Ukraine. And it's also critical for Russia. We saw what happened right now. The Sea of Azov is closed. The Black Sea essentially closed for commercial traffic. So those are where the export facilities in the Ukraine are located. They're on the Black Sea in Odessa, as an example. Mm -hmm. Major export facilities there. And the problem right now is that there is production from last year, and it's in country elevators within Ukraine and in the export facilities in the port of Odessa, but they can't move it. Nothing can move out of there. So everything's backlogged. It's quite a problem. And that kind of leads into the next step is Cargill, as an example, we're trying to export out of the Black Sea. It was, was, was what early days of the conflict. One of their charter vessels was hit by a shell or an ordnance and uh, suffered some damage, no loss of life, but that's the impact. And as soon as that happened and the conflict started to increase, I'm going to say all, but I say mostly all of the multinationals, pulled, uh, so they shut everything down. So everything was kind of left where it was. Rain is in store. You know, there's three major players that are present in the Ukraine. There's a number of smaller ones too, but Archer Daniels Midland, they have huge uh, interests in the Ukraine. They have oil crushing facilities. They have a grain, major grain export facility in Odessa. They have inland terminals. They have river storage facilities, and they have a major trading office. Bungie is there as well with oil seed crushing capability and a grain export facility. And Cario has uh, inland and port facilities as well as oil seed crushing capacity there. All of those three are shut down right now. You know, they, they employ thousands of people. So everything is at a standstill. And they've done that basically for the protection of their people. And they, they didn't want to be seen to be continuing to export stuff and, and be a target for Russia to take that out. So everything's sitting. What, what does that mean? Well, the Ukraine has contracts as I understand, open contracts right now that have to be filled by June worth over $6 billion US. The contracts are such that the vessels have to be loaded and in the destination ports by the end of June. So if you estimate $300 a ton, that's over 20 million tons of grain that need to be shipped out under contract before the end of June. That's not going to happen. Not going to happen because... As I mentioned earlier, the shipping routes on the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov closed. And even if they open, I can tell you, now looking at the, at, from a shipper's perspective, a lot of ship owners won't go into that area because it's still a conflict zone. Even if, if yeah. Russia said, well, okay, it's all good, move in there, they won't go there. And even if they did, the insurance rate, the ocean going rates now are unbelievable. If you go into that conflict zone, like that high, and, and, and it makes sense. Yeah, it does. You can't get in. I think it's fair enough to say that our majority of the ocean-bound shipping that uh, would normally happen out of Ukraine is, is not going to happen this year, or at least not going to happen in time to uh, hit those open contracts. If the conflict were to end tomorrow, those contracts that you're talking about for the 1st of June would still not get filled. Absolutely not. There is no way. We're past the point. You're first, you're going to have to have people get the confidence to come back in there again with their ships. Secondly, you've got to get those ships. They're not just sitting someplace waiting for someone to load them. You've got to get those ships there, and then you've got to get them to where they're going. Three months would be a really good turnaround time. And when you think about all of that, we do talk about this in Canada as, as temporary foreign workers. Well, the Ukraine uses temporary foreign workers to help harvesting crops, production process, and even the multinationals that actually have people that work for them, these people have either departed the Ukraine completely because of the war or won't come in there because of potential repercussions or escalated conflict going forward. So the human resource side of feeding agriculture is another big piece. Like, where are these people going to come from? And you also have the situation where you've got, what, four and a half, five million refugees that have left the country. Exactly. Uh, that does not take into account the people that have been displaced just internally. Exactly. And are we going to have a major labor shortage there when uh, it comes time to try and get these crops out of the field or get the crops planted? Without a doubt, that is another big problem. And the other thing, too, is there's infrastructure damage on those export facilities. Limited right now, but there has been some export damage. The export facilities, the grain facilities, 
they have to be repaired. Yes. So it's like dominoes, like we were saying earlier, but there's big issues out there, big issues. Like I said, if the war ended tomorrow, you're still three months, four months away from getting that grain anywhere where it's going to be able to be moved offshore, or at least getting it to the ports where it needs to be. And in the meantime, people still need something to eat. Exactly. And I think you're optimistic at three to four months, Mike. I really do. Yeah, I can say what I can throw whatever number I want out there because this isn't ending tomorrow, right? No, exactly. Exactly. And it's not a case where you just turn the key and everybody shows up to work. Where's the diesel fuel coming from? It's to my point about that earlier comment where the producer or the farmer standing out there, no diesel, can't run my tractor. The distribution for fuels now getting back into the Ukraine, that's another problem. Yeah, the pipeline's empty. Like in a lot of this stuff, it's empty. And it takes a while to get that stuff moving again. It does. Right? Like whether you're you're exporting or whether you're trying to bring fuel in. Again, you say, well, tomorrow it ends. Are we looking two weeks? I doubt that you could have fuel to that farmer in two weeks. I'm thinking more like four, maybe more than that, depending on what damage has been done to the various infrastructures there in order to distribute it. Well, and that's it. A lot of the fuel tank farms were targeted early on, especially in that eastern section by Russia. So they wiped them out. So how do you move that in? I mean, to build a tank farm, to hold diesel, I mean, major fuel facility like that, I can't imagine it's a year or more to rebuild that. You're, you're talking about bringing stuff in. That's, you know, fuel coming in there. That's a distribution center. Now you're talking about distributing it from somewhere else. Exactly. And bringing it in by truck from or, or rail somewhere else, probably truck, and then trying to distribute it out to the end users. That's going to be a logistical nightmare. It's never been done before. You've got to develop the systems in order to do it. It's just... Exactly. People are going to go looking for grain. They're going to have to find it somewhere else. Where is that grain going to come from? Well, it's interesting. They're, they're already scrambling. A lot of countries are really scrambling. And there's two things that I can see that are happening right now. EU countries have implemented export limits on the amount of grain that can be shipped out. So it's a protectionism move or domestic food supply to ensure food that the country doesn't suffer food insecurity. So that's happening all around the world. China is sitting on huge stockpiles of grain, which they will, they'll never release those. I mean, that's for the interest of, of the country versus uh, exporting anywhere in the world. The only bright spots I see are production in India and Australia, which are coming off of bumper crops. India in particular has had probably the last five years of just absolute bumper crops of grain, and Australia is doing quite well as well. So those countries will be able to provide some relief, but not nearly enough relief to be able to cover the deficit that's going to be left by the Ukraine. Is your organization in need of funding? Trillium's Roots Community Fund is currently looking to provide money to projects for organizations that are agriculturally focused. Applications are now being accepted towards facilities or equipment upgrades, funding for research, innovations, and much more. To learn more about Roots, including how to apply, visit our website at trilliummutual.com and click Community at the top of the page. Many people will know that we have great capacity in this country to produce wheat and corn and that sort of thing. And, and particularly, we're known for the wheat coming in off the prairies there. And I hear people say, well, we'll just produce more wheat. The farmers should produce more wheat out there or should produce more grain out there. What are the, some of the barriers to that happening? The drought conditions, I think, have caused a lot of concern for everybody that we've experienced over the last year or two. I think going forward, uh, the climatologists have indicated El Nina is still present. It's going to continue on and provide that drying condition throughout the U.S. Midwest and up into the prairie. So that is a bit of a, a production concern. I hope that's not the case. And recent snows have indicated maybe that there will be sufficient moisture, especially in the southern part of the prairies, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. But there is a limitation there in terms of how much can be produced based on weather conditions. The other thing I think is really is the cost of the inputs. Not an issue for seed, but really for the fertilizers that are out there. Fertilizer prices are at record highs as well. And part of the problem there is because Russia and Belarus actually are major producers of fertilizers in the world. And a lot of those countries have got sanctions against them. You know, it's putting pressure everywhere on fertilizer supplies to the point where 
some of the producers are saying, hmm, I'm going to cut back on the amount of inputs I'm, I'm using. We'll, we'll just go with whatever the yield produces, which will, could hamper uh, yield production for sure. So those are kind of the things that are going on right now and, and switching the crops. A lot of producers in Western Canada have really got their eye on canola because canola is a high valued crop. It just bodes well for switching crops into those type of commodities, the oilseed commodities versus the grains in the world, which are really needed to feed the world. The oilseed production isn't all about domestic consumption oils. It, a lot of it is about biofuels and the renewable fuels that are being produced because of the petroleum high prices. So now you get into that ethical discussion about are we feeding the world to feed people or are we growing crops to produce fuel, alternate fuels? So those are the kind of pressures I, th I think that are the immediate pressures that I see on the horizon for producers. But there is great opportunity, tremendous opportunity to get in on the shortfall in the world food supply to be able to produce more and more. In the U.S. and other countries, a lot of the land that was not under cultivation now, there's efforts afoot to get that back into production as quickly as possible. There will be a deficit in time between the time you go into production and the time you, you grow a crop and be able to feed people, but that's all it is right now. There's nothing much we can do about that. I do want to say one thing. When I talked earlier about the Canadian production and the carry forward of grains, uh, you know, typically we have about 8 million ton carry forward into the previous year. Last, like I said, last year production in Canada was 78 million. This year it's going to be half of that because, well, last crop year is half of that. The carry forward is going to be very thin. If projections hold the carry forward into the next crop year, 2022 23, maybe as low as two and a half million tons, which is a record low. My concern, and I hope I'm dead wrong here, is if there's another drought condition in Canada, you're on the borderline of food insufficiency in Canada. This is an issue for the Canadian Ag Minister, and they're, they're aware of it. It's part of uh, you know, the whole global insight into food insecurities around the world and how countries react. One of the things we always hear is, yeah, Canada can step up, we can feed the world. We might be able to in normal growing years, or at least assist in feeding the world in normal growing years. In drought condition years, we best be looking at our, our own domestic food supply, and, and we all see it. And even if we've got enough food to feed Canada, look at the prices on your supermarket shelves. I mean, as our supply, it's supply and demand. As supply dwindles, prices go up. We're seeing a lot of consumers right now struggling with the, it's the flour, it's the oils, the domestic consumption oils, everything is just skyrocketing in price. It's an interesting scenario playing out here. It's not something that we normally think of. We don't normally think of Canada as being a country that could not have enough food or be short on food. We're always used to having enough here, but we're at the mercy of what the weather does. And another dry year out west is certainly going to cut into what we produce. Absolutely, Will. Let's hope that doesn't happen. There's a limit to how much extra we can produce anyway. It's great to say, hey, we'll produce some more, but most farmers are trying to get the maximum out of their inputs as it sits anyway. So there's limited amount of potential there at the best of times. And then you have to get it off the prairies and down the seaway or, or to the western seaboard and get it shipped to where it needs to go as well. Absolutely, Mike. And you know, as you say that, just think about that, like the disruptions that we spoke about earlier in trade routes and in ocean freight rates and in ocean and freight destinations, it's, it's causing unbelievable congestion around the world. So countries that, and we'll play this back to the Ukraine, so the countries that typically would buy from the Ukraine are now buying from other locations, which means freight routes are actually changing. So a lot of freight that is available or can be purchased at a premium, it takes longer from the shipping port to the destination port because it's changing. And some of those destination ports are now in congestion because of container vessels. So the bulkers are backed up behind it. It's a real problem. It starts with one thing. It's like dominoes. And then all of a sudden, you have a whole bunch of uh, problems right across the spectrum here in terms of supply chains and trade routes. Quite, quite interesting here what's happening. But China used to buy a lot of corn from Ukraine. And now China is buying a little bit from the U.S., but more from Russia. 
There's a pretty tight relationship that we saw developing after the Olympics, where China had some prohibitions because of phytosanitary issues with Russia. They signed off on a lot of that. The relationship and the trade relationship is now building between Russia. A lot of those patterns now are starting to develop again. Unfortunately, the U.S. and Canada has always been on kind of the cusp of trade with China since the Maui incidents. It's changing the dynamics of where we're able to export some of our products as well around the world. There's going to be markets for it. It's just a question of where are the markets and the markets finding the buyers. And then, of course, you mentioned the trade routes all being disrupted. You have to get that product there as well. Absolutely. If we have a whole lot of grains and product that still is sitting in Ukraine and the question about how much gets produced for next year and still maybe have problems getting what is produced shipped out of there, we've got some countries there that are really going to be scrambling to try and find food for their citizens. You're definitely right, Mike. You know, some of the, some of the countries like India, Israel, the African countries, those are the ones that are most vulnerable because they are right now. And when you think about it, a lot of the commodity that was exported from Europe went into places like those countries. So the developing world is where Ukrainian wheat has always been an essential import, and now it's not there. So where do they get that food? Where do they get those crops? We're also hearing from, you know, you said, well, European countries are putting export quotas on because they want to look after their food supply. And we talk about Canada If we have another drought year, we're not going to have as much. We're going to look after our domestic markets first. The countries that are producing always look after themselves and then export what they have for extra. If there isn't any extra, it's just going to make that whole problem worse. That's right. So we don't see anything in the on the near future of the conflict and the war in Ukraine stopping there. uh, And the world is going to have to adapt. How long does it Or is it going to take the world to adapt to be able to feed some of these countries that are going to be short? Certainly in the short term, we know that there's going to be some pain there if we can't get the grain out of the Ukraine area there. How long before we can adapt to that? Well, Mike, I would say it'll take at least one or two crop years before the world's supplies can can balance themselves off and heighten production and yield production to compensate for that. And hopefully by that time, the Ukraine is back on. So at least one crop year for sure, 22, 23. And it might take another year beyond that just to stabilize production in the world. That's barring any more climate change effects around the world because the climate is changing, as we all know. And it's just difficult to predict what the next catastrophe might be in terms of production in what area of the world. So it's very, very, very tough. I heard a stat that there's over 48 million people in the world that are currently starving. And that's expected to grow because of the conflict now to somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 million people that are food insecure and will be in the classification of starving. And when you think about things, and I'm not a political analyst, but You know, this causes geopolitical problems around the world. So when we don't have food for these people, it's got the effect of destabilizing nations. Mm -hmm. If, If you think about some of our people will remember the Arab Spring, a lot of that happened because people were starving and they started to overthrow governments. And that's exactly what could happen here as a result of the food insecurity. It's a real tough problem here. UN numbers, and I've, I've used these numbers before, but we run in this world in the, anywhere from about 900 million, sometimes down a little lower than that, sometimes up close to a billion people that uh, have that food insecurity. Now, it's different from the actual people that are starving there, but these are people that on a regular basis from a day-to-day basis may run out of food. So there's a huge problem there. And we haven't seen that number change in 50 years much. It's, it's still remained the same. But I think it's fair to say that that number is going to go up uh, over the next few years here. We're going to see a lot of people that are not necessarily going to be starving, but they're certainly going to be wondering where their next meal is going to come from. Well, exactly. And, you know, to your point about the uh, geopolitical scene and the uncertainty and destabilization of nations, what what happens is as people become food insecure, they tend to move. So they're moving to other areas. So it's a real ethical problem like can you is there a way to get food to a starving people for let's say for 50 cents a day can you do that or do 
people leave and become refugees in other countries where now you have to house them and feed them if you can. And it's going to cost countries $70 a day to create that. So, you know, farming is so important and agricultural distribution of the products around the world. It's immensely important, primarily for ensuring people have food to eat and they're not starving, but also for geopolitical stability. I mean, that's a big part of it is food. Food and space are two the two big ones. And in this case, we're looking at issues. We're talking high prices because we're tight on supply as it was. And then we have the war in Ukraine and all of a sudden one of the major exporters. Well, if you count Russia, who's in many places in the world has had their products embargoed, we're talking two of the major uh, exporters of food that will not have as much on the market in the next 12 to 24 months. Absolutely. And I think right now, it's, it's, I was looking for data on the multinationals that are still operating in Russia. Some of them are there yet. As much as you would pull out, as a number of companies did in various industrial sectors, I guess the ethical question there is, if they pulled out, would there be anything left? You take out Russia's production, that's huge. That would just cause a catastrophe in the world. Some of them are still there. And they're still working with the Russian agricultural department of the government and and still trying to get sales on contract and production continuing going forward and processing done in their facility. It's something you'd, you'd like to see Russia perhaps cut off from all of that. But at the end of the day, it's just going to hurt the rest of the world. As I mentioned earlier, most of the exports happening off of the Sea of Azaz and the Black Sea so the production can still continue in these facilities. And I'm just going to make a point back on the Ukrainian farming methods and the production facilities. What made me think of it is a very, very high level production facilities, modern facilities in the Ukraine, their crush plants, their bulk handling facilities, state of the art, really state of the art. So anyone ever thought they're a backward country, they're not. By any set stretch of imagination, they really have some sophisticated tools. And they're also into more onto precision farming now, where they're using drones for agriculture. And they also use satellite imaging. So in terms of, we talked a little bit about fertilizer prices and that sort of thing, and who can afford it. But they're using dedicated amounts of fertilizer strategically based on uh, contour mapping, crop growth and everything else like that. So they're really a high level of sophistication in agriculture, which uh, maybe a lot of people didn't realize, but they're certainly there. You don't get to be a major exporter in the world without having some of those tools that uh, in many cases we take for granted in this country, but don't necessarily expect to find them in some of the other countries, but they've got to be there or you just can't, simply can't get that kind of production. And certainly you can't get it out of the country either. The infrastructure problems are major issues in many countries that uh, are capable of producing more than what they do. Absolutely. But that backlog in the Ukraine is huge. And when you think about commodities, like so, some of the products will sit and, and you extend uh, the carry on those for a while, like your wheats and such. You'll have to turn the crop in, in storage. You need to turn them to aerate them to, yep. pre- to prevent heating. But oil seeds, different game. I mean, you have a very short storage period for oil seeds because they do tend to, to heat quite quickly. It's, it's really, really tough. You can't get them out. These are not going for confection. These are going into the fresh market. So... The crush facilities are cut down. So I, I don't know what the percentage of spoilage will be for harvested product from last year. You know, the winter wheat has planted in the fall time or, you know, perhaps in January at the late part of the season. And it'll be harvested uh, coming up in June. Some of it starts early May, depending on the weather conditions. So May, June for winter wheat crop. You've got all of that product coming off if they can even get it off the fields. And it's what we talked about earlier about how much existing product from last crop year is in the facilities. Where do you put it? Do you put it on the ground? Well, you know that's a recipe for spoilage. And getting the new crop in the ground, I don't know. That backlog is a double-edged sword there, right? It's not just about turning it or it's spoiling. It's also, okay, we can produce the crop, but if we can't get it out of the country, there's a limited places to put it. Exactly right. In the Ukraine, uh, they have 10% of all the grain from the interior part of the country moved by a river to the seaport facilities in Odessa. 20 to 25% moved by truck. 65 to 75% moved by rail. 
there's 53 million metric tons of storage within the country and 6 million metric tons of uh, seaport storage in Odessa and a couple of the seaports. We're moving a lot of that by rail, assuming them to get that to get it to the seaports. Do we have the opportunity to move that by rail and simply get it out of the country to a different seaport someplace? Or is there logistical problems with that as well? There really is logistical problems. First of all, a lot of that infrastructure, whether it be rail or truck or even the river vessels, they're facing the same problem. They're under attack. So a lot of that infrastructure shut down. What Ukraine has tried to do is they've tried to move some product to the western part of the country and bring it across to places like Poland or, or such. There's a couple of problems with that. First of all, that, that's not an established distribution route. And even between the Ukraine and Poland, the track gauges are different. So you have to offload the product and then reload it into other rail wagons to move it across the country. So it's not an efficient method to move grain, for sure. You know, you just have to move it. If you're moving it into Poland, you will probably have to move it to a distribution facility in the Black or the Baltic Sea. So it's, it's very inefficient, let's put it that way. It's not likely going to be an option to move a lot of the product then? No, I would say absolutely not. It's just that's not the infrastructure and the logistics that the country has been built around. It's more direct south to export facilities on the on the Black Sea. I don't know where this all ends, but I do know that, as I said before, there's going to be some people go hungry, and not just for one year, but for several years. So this is going to have quite a ripple effect by the time we're done. Pat, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We've been speaking with Pat Bushby about grain prices and some of the issues that are surrounding the conflict in Ukraine. Thank you, Mike. It's been my pleasure to be here and uh, happy to join you anytime to talk about agriculture and uh, just how important agriculture and farming is to all countries and in particular to rural Ontario and Canada as a whole. You've been listening to The Back 40. Join us next time when our guest will be Matthew Bamsey from the Canadian Space Agency and we'll be talking about the Deep Space Food Challenge a competition to develop new technologies to produce food for future space missions while expanding opportunities for food production here on Earth. That's next time on The Back 40. You've been listening to The Back 40, brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance. Be sure to subscribe to The Back 40 wherever you find your favorite podcasts so that you don't miss an episode. The Back 40, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm Mike Brine. Until next time, take care and stay safe.